Now, Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. It's been a tumultuous couple of weeks at Brown University. Racism is not for debate. Protesters drowned out a speech by New York City Police Commissioner Ray Kelly, attracting national headlines and sparking a heated debate about the Ivy League school's tolerance for diverse points of view. The Kelly controversy came just days after Brown's trustees signed off on a new blueprint for the school, building on distinction, laying out the university's goals and growth strategy for the next 10 years. The plan's impact will be felt far beyond College Hill as local leaders look to Brown to anchor the redevelopment of the Jewelry District and to keep serving as Rhode Island's fifth biggest source of private jobs. This week on Executive Suite, a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Brown University President Christina Paxson. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, President Paxson. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to have you back here in uh, the WPRI studios. Now, we had you, we showed you there a year ago talking to us when you were still fairly new. You've been president for over a year now. How's the job treating you? Any surprises? Uh, I love the job. It is demanding. It's uh, incredibly challenging. It's very, very interesting, and I love it. So um, we're going to talk about something you may not have loved so far before we get to the strategic plan. This controversy with Ray Kelly, I have to ask you about. Sure. Um, I know you weren't there at this event that was disrupted, but uh, you've come out very strongly about your concerns about what happened. What was your initial reaction when you found out what had happened? Well, uh, I, I found out about the event probably 20 minutes after it happened, and my initial reaction was that we had to make a very clear, firm statement about the importance of freedom of expression on a university campus, something I feel very strongly about. So we came out with that right away. Uh, and then for the past week and a half, uh, two weeks, we've been dealing with the aftermath of that, trying to get the campus uh, going in the right direction, helping people understand what happened, why it happened, and how we're going to move forward. And you've, you've t you're taking some specific steps, I know, that you've uh, re disclosed recently about looking at it. What, what steps is the university right. taking in response? Well, they're, re they're really two separate issues. One is to address uh, the incident itself. And uh, there, there are two parts to that. One is to take a hard look at how the university handles controversial events. This should not have happened. And the truth is we host controversial events all the time. So something went awry with this particular lecture. We need to figure that out. Uh, this was clearly a violation of our student code of conduct. We need to figure out how to proceed with that. The broader issue that will go into the next, into the spring and, and probably into the next year is uh, a more important and almost societal issue of how do we deal with uh, creating a diverse and inclusive community where everybody feels comfortable speaking in their mind and maintain freedom of expression. This is an issue for the nation. Brown is a microcosm of the nation and we have to we have to be able to have a community where we can have civil discourse. One of your um, professors of engineering, Iris Behar, um, told Inside Higher Ed, quote, Brown has a liberal student body, there is no denying that, and Brown has a liberal-leaning faculty, we can't pretend otherwise. Do you agree, and do you think Brown has a problem with listening to voices that aren't politically liberal? I think Brown is, is a liberal institution, no more so than many other institutions. But there are also plenty of people on campus who have a wide range of opinions, who are libertarians, who are conservatives. And we need to create a climate where even people with minority viewpoints feel comfortable speaking and are respected for what they think. All right, now uh, I want to move on because there's so much going on at Brown. As I said at the top, it's so important to Rhode Island more generally, which is why I'm so glad you're here today. Yeah. Um, I'm curious first and foremost about the university's financial situation. The recession was very tough on basically every organization in the right. country of every size. Sure. Um, how is Brown's financial position today? Do you feel, has the, have things recovered from where from what went right. wrong during the recession right. for places? So, so we are in a stable financial situation, I would say. Uh, we have a small deficit and we're trying to figure out how to manage that and, and get it, eliminate it in the, in the coming two years. Our endowment, because of good returns over the past year and uh, good fundraising results, is just about back to where it was before the financial crisis occurred. I believe $2.9 billion almost That's right. uh, at the end of last fiscal That's year. That's right. That's right. So it's taken us this long to get back to where we were then. Uh, so I'm confident about the future. I, th I think we're in good shape. Uh, we face headwinds 
uh, most notably from declines in federal funding for research. And that's something we're looking at very carefully and trying to figure out how to deal with. And, you know, Brett, you mentioned the endowment. Brown's endowment, it's $2.9 billion. It sounds like a lot of money people at home. It is a lot of money in a, in a common sense way. But it's also the smallest in the Ivy League. Um, do you yeah. think, does that have an impact on Brown in, in, this, in the world you're competing in, at Harvard, the other Ivies, as well as globally? Right. Well, you know, one thing I should say is adjusting for size, so endowment per student. I think we're uh, not at the bottom of the Ivy League. Okay. So that, that's a good thing. And compared to the vast majority of universities, we are so fortunate to have the endowment that we do. Uh, I think it's true, though, that many of our major competitors uh, are able to do things more easily than we can. And so we have to think very carefully about how we spend money, uh, about what our priorities are. And I know we're going to talk about strategic planning, but a lot of that strategic planning was around how do we prioritize where we're going to make investments over the next decade? A perfect segue, actually, because that was my next question. So we mentioned building on distinction, the new strategic plan. It sets out uh, the vision for Brown for the next 10 years, and it's, right. a, it's a major document under your leadership taking over from Ruth Simmons. Can you give us a broad sense of, of uh, what, what the thinking was going into that and what, what vision it sets out? So, so the, primary, uh, the primary focus of that plan was to say, where do we want to be in 10 years? Which is, we want to be brown. I love the culture and character of brown, and I think everybody else does. But how, we can, how can we build on brown strength so that in 10 years we are not only known for being a terrific university with a strong undergraduate program, but we're also known for being uh, at the very top in terms of a number of very specifically defined uh, priorities in, in research and education. So we want to be great. And I think we already are. Uh, but there are areas that we can build on and be even better. Um, first question people often have with these sorts of plans, is Brown going to get bigger under this plan, however you define it? Brown will get uh, somewhat bigger. So what we're projecting for this plan is a growth of about 1% per year in students and faculty. That seems modest, but over 10 years, 1% per year adds up. Uh, there are a couple reasons for that. Uh, one is we're only taking a small fraction of our applicant pool. We have great students who want to come to Brown. They can add a lot to the community. Uh, also, for many of our ambitions, uh, there are economies of scale, if I can speak like an economist. <laughs> and we, can, we think we can do a better job, we can have more impact on the world if we're a little bit bigger. And um, the plan also talks a lot about educational innovation. And I think it's funny to imagine a 250-year-old institution thinking about innovation. What does that actually mean about innovating? Is that are you going to teach them and is everyone going to stand up when you're teaching? How yeah, does it work? Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, if, if we're not innovative in education, then we might as well give up. I mean, educate, the way we educate students has to change, and it has changed. So Brown has been a leader in innovation with its open curriculum, very distinctive. And what we thought a lot about during the planning process was, you know, how can Brown respond to changes in technology, increases in globalization, while keeping its commitment to this open liberal arts education that is the calling card of Brown? Very distinctive. All right, we have to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk much more about the vision for Brown University President Christina Paxson has in the new strategic plan and some of the other issues going on on College Hill these days. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and I'm very happy to be joined this week by the 19th president of Brown University, Christina Paxson. And we were talking before the break about the strategic plan, the building on distinction. People mm -hmm. can download that on Brown's website if they want to get a close look themselves. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about, we talk constantly on this show about Brown's economic development. Mm -hmm. And Brown is mentioned constantly as an important anchor institution. Um, based on what, you, what you've gone through in this strategic planning process and your own thinking about Brown's role in Rhode Island, right. where do you see strengths that Brown has or focuses it's going to have that fit in with, with the larger economic future of Rhode Island? Right, right. That, that's a great question. and we, we could probably spend a whole show talking about this. It's, it's a huge question. Uh, I, this, in this strategic plan, I think Rhode Island and Providence factor in, in a number of areas. Uh, one is the what most people think of, which is wh where are we going to build, what are we going to put in the jewelry district, what are we going to put on College Hill, and I think all that's important. A lot of our expansion will have an impact on development in the city. The, the aspect of our plan, though, that I think is actually more important concerns the research that Brown is doing and will be doing and the way that that can have very important spillovers to the development of businesses 
in Rhode Island, in Providence going forward. Uh, that's especially true in biomedical research, mm -hmm. in brain science, an area where we have great strength in engineering. And you know, I'm optimistic that with the right partnerships between Brown and other institutions, we can have an impact on the economy of the state in, in a very substantial and way. We can't dive into all of them, but I ha you mentioned brain science, and uh, one of the most interesting yeah. people I think at Brown right now is John Donahue, mm -hmm. who people might have heard of, the brain researcher. I mean, understanding the human brain is right here is one of the seven big focuses in this strategic plan. It is. What's going on with that research? What's exciting to you about it? Well, uh, so you may have heard that John Donahue and his team just got a very prominent prize, Israeli prize, called the Brain Prize, <laughs> which tells you what it's about. Uh, but they're doing very innovative work on neurotechnology, uh, developing things that help people who have paralysis and other neurological impairments. Uh, we're doing some very interesting work on uh, molecular neuroscience, too. So that's a growth area. Uh, it fits in with work that Lifespan is doing. It fits in with work that the University of Rhode Island is doing. Uh, the governor has talked about brain science as being an area of, of, of specialization for Rhode Island. So I, I think it's great do if you we think can Brown, play into that. Do you that. think Rhode Island can compete in that area with, we saw Columbia, I think, got $200 million to start their Brian, brain science. I mean, do we have a problem with scale here about the amount of resources Brown, even working with partners, can bring to something like that? I don't think so. I, I think it's a question of doing what we do very, very well. Uh, you, you can have a very big and broad neuroscience program. Uh, the work that we're doing is focused in very specific areas, in areas that we think we can make a huge, a huge impact. Um, the medical school been a big focus in recent years at Brown. Um, yeah. I, I'm just curious, very big picture, how do you see Brown impacting the future of the healthcare sector in Rhode Island, the way healthcare is delivered here? Do you see a role yeah. for the school in that? Uh, absolutely, and, and this is something I care a lot about. We're seeing so many changes in healthcare. Uh, we're going to be moving, like it or not, to very different models of providing care, paying for care care. Uh, I think Rhode Island's in a really interesting place because uh, it has limited number of people, uh, some very good health care systems. Brown is affiliated with them. And I think we can play a very important role both in training the physicians who will provide this new kind of care and also uh, being integrated with the research uh, that's taking place in the state to help help provide better care. You mentioned physicians. Uh, Brown's, I think, one of the few major medical schools that doesn't have physicians in a faculty group practice. Is that something you might look at it to partly to, to drive more revenue back into the research project with federal funding falling? Well, I mean, this is something we can talk about with Lifespan and, and our partners over time, but that's still very much in, in progress. It's far it's yeah. far away on that. Um, it, you mentioned Lifespan. It's a nonprofit parent of Brown Hospital, actually the mm -hmm. largest private employer in the state, and your partner in the medical school, uh, or affiliate, I should say, in the medical school. Right. They have some financial challenges, like many nonprofit uh, hospital networks. They may need to cut, they say, up to $150 million in spending. Does that impact the medical school, the students, and the, and the faculty who are associated with that? Right. I think... I think what we're all trying to balance, and this is not at all unique to uh, Brown and Rhode Island, is in an environment where federal funding for research is being reduced and where uh, a lot of the costs are being squeezed out of the healthcare system and will continue to be over time, we have to think very hard about how we can support the enterprise of research and medical education, which all of us value, our hospital partners as well as Brown. And this is going to be the big challenge over the coming three to five years. I mean, one of the questions I've had is we talk so much about the meds and eds driving growth in Rhode Island, but the meds and the eds, uh, Brown and Lifespan uh -huh. as our two anchors in those areas, are both facing cost pressures, particularly from the federal government. I mean, right. can meds and eds drive the economy in the coming years in a time where when you, your institutions are under such pressure to reduce costs or at least hold the line on costs? You know, I think it can, and in some ways we are, uh, you know, ironically in, better, in a better place than universities that are much more heavily dependent on research grants for everything that they do. So while we're facing pressures, other places are fa pr facing those pressures and sometimes even, even in more extreme ways. Another hot topic in Providence, I get asked about it all the time, the South Street Power Station yes. or the Dynamo House, that big hulking uh, old power station. Uh -huh. There's now a big redevelopment proposal, a joint Brown URI Rhode Island College project. Uh -huh. Dr. David Dooley of URI was on the show recently, said that he thinks it's on track. Is, is that project on track from I your point of view? I think it is on track. It is not a done deal. 
Uh, but I'm very optimistic. I'm very excited about it, and I hope it goes forward. And what are you yeah. what are you waiting for? Is Brown is Brown prepared if the if the states part of it comes together? To, or are there also things on your end? You well, I mean, there there are issues like negotiating leases and and figuring out floor plans and who would go where. Uh, so a lot of small details that need to get sorted out. And then, of course, you know, you or I and Rick, they have independent nursing programs. They would be sharing space, and they need to come together and figure out how to do that well. A lot of moving parts. A lot of moving parts, uh, but nothing that if, if, if there's support, and I think there is support, there's nothing that should get in the way of this. Um, one other question related to the jewelry district. A lot of people seemed surprised in economic development circles when Brown made the decision to keep the new School of Engineering up on College right. Hill, not build it out um, on the jewelry district. And I'm curious both if you could put that decision in context, but also explain how do you view what goes on College Hill and what goes in the jewelry district right. as Brown goes? Because College right. Hill seems pretty full right now. <laughs> yes, it is. And, and a big part of the planning was was doing this campus planning where we looked very carefully at where we have space, what our needs are, and what should go where. Uh, when I started at Brown, I actually thought that engineering would and should go into the jewelry district. I'll be quite honest about that. But after we analyzed how students interact between engineering and the humanities and the social sciences, they're moving between these departments on a very frequent basis we realized that it would do great damage to the campus community to move engineering out of, off of College Hill and into the jewelry district. We also discovered, though, that there are many things that will do very well in the jewelry district. And that includes uh, biomedical research, things that are related to the medical school, things that are related more to the hospital, our hospital partners. Uh, as well as administrative needs. So in no way an abandonment of the jewelry no. district or growth there for Brown? Just a rethinking of what, what belongs on College Hill and what belongs in the jewelry district. We're thinking of these as both parts of our campus. All right, overdue for a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about how a Brown University alum may soon be chairwoman of the Federal Reserve. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and I'm joined, very happy to be joined this week by Brown University President Christina Paxson. And uh, we're talking about growth in the strategic plan. Um, graduate education, another big focus in the mm -hmm. new strategic plan. Um, do you see adding a lot of graduate education, or is it adding more resources to what's there now? What's your view on that? Well, graduate education is two parts. Doctoral education, PhD students, and master's students. Mm -hmm. So very different. Uh, in terms of doc doctoral education, it's, it's essential to the growth and development of Brown for it to have outstanding doctoral programs. Uh, this doesn't take away from its undergraduate focus. I think it adds strength to it. So we'll be focusing on improving the quality of our doctoral programs along with some modest growth. The area where we'll see larger growth is in master's education. Uh, we have been experimenting for the last two years uh, with some really terrific executive master's programs that combine online and in-person education. We call them blended learning programs. Uh, I think that's an area that we can do a great job in. We already are. And it's an area of growth for Brown. We've talked a ton about science and technology, but yeah. the humanities are, a lot of us think of Brown poets and English writers and people thinking big thoughts and doing artwork and things like that. Uh -huh. You wrote recently in the New Republic, you're an economist by training, and you wrote, you made an economic case for why we should continue to invest in the humanities, not solely focus on technical education and very closely value-added economically education. Right. Why do you think the humanities still matters in this, in this day and age? Oh, I think it matters so much. I, and I'm speaking as somebody who before I went to economics studied English literature and philosophy. And you, you know, when you, when you think about preparing people for lives, not just what job they're going to get the year after they graduate from college, but for the next 30 or 40 years, what they need to be able to do is to think, to continue to learn over the course of their lives. Uh, technical knowledge depreciates very quickly. I mean, I learned Fortran in college. Nobody, you, no, you don't even know what it is if you're if you're under the age of forty, and uh, and and so I think these broad skills of thinking and reading and critical thought, uh, creative thought, these are incredibly important. And if, and if we ignore them, we do so at our 
at our peril. Um, we talked a little bit about, about finances, the financial aid and the cost of college, a constant discussion. Brown in a little bit of a different position, I presume, as an Ivy League and such a famous brand, but are you worried about those issues of the rising cost of college and financial aid from Brown's perspective? I, I am worried about the rising cost of college. It, it's hard not to be. Uh, I'm worried about it from an economy-wide perspective. In fact, I'm, you know, the, the rise in the cost of public education, I think, is a huge problem for this country. Uh, Brown is fortunate in that we can offer nearly half of our students financial aid. Now, in our strategic plan, we talk about where we need to do better. And one of the big areas is, you know, families who are squarely in the middle class, whose incomes are too high to qualify for substantial financial aid, but for whom college is a real burden. Mm -hmm. And that's an area that we want to improve and do better. Uh, you know, a lot of the costs of college, the increase in costs, are due to Increases in salaries, we're in a very competitive market. Increases in the cost of IT. You know, y we can be as careful as we want in controlling costs, but there, there are only so many levers we can push on. But believe me, we're looking. <laughs> yeah. Um, as we tape this, the Senate Bank Committee is grilling Janet Yellen, a Brown graduate herself, for their nomination to succeed Ben Bernanke as first female chairwoman of the Federal Reserve Bank uh, as Brown's president and an economist yourself. What are your thoughts on Yellen's nomination? I think it's terrific. I mean, I do not know her personally. We've been exchanging emails after she was nominated uh, to have a woman, an, econ an economist, to be the first pres female president of the Fed is just just wonderful, so I'm, I'm very happy. And talking a little about history there, you know, next March, Brown turns 250 years old. It I mean, does. a quarter of a millennium, that is a long time when you really right. step back and think about it. Are there any big plans to celebrate that March 7th, 8th time frame? There are. In fact, uh, we will kick off the 250th with a celebration in March, a uh, celebration of the signing of the charter that established Brown, and we are structuring that celebration as an open house. Uh, all members of the Providence and Rhode Island and Connecticut, however far you want to drive, are welcome to come. We're inviting a bunch of school children to campus. Uh, there will be a big birthday cake. So you're welcome to come and, and all of your well, viewers cake. are too. If there's cake. <laughs> if there's yeah. cake, we'll be there. Yep. Um, you know, we, we're we running low on time, but I want to ask you about one, a controversial decision the university made not to divest from coal. There were, students were pushing you on that. Right, they were. And the trustees made a decision that was not the right way to go in. About 30 seconds left. What was the brief version of that decision? Well, the brief version of that decision was divesting from uh, coal would have been making a symbolic statement, but not a very... Um, targeted or focused symbolic statement. I, I don't think that it's appropriate to use investment decisions to make broad general statements about uh, the importance of climate change. I do think climate change is something we have to take very, very seriously. Has there been a lot of blowback to that decision? Uh, there's been some, yeah, there has been. I, you know, I think the students who worked hard and who were passionate about this issue were very disappointed, and I can understand that. This is a judgment call. Some people are going to agree, some people aren't. Uh, but I respect what they were trying to do. The tough job of a university president. All right, that's <laughs> all the time we have this week. I really want to thank Brown University President Christina Paxson for being with us. I hope we'll be able to have her back again sometime. If you missed any of this show or any other episode of Executive Suite, you can catch all of those online on WPRI.com. And don't forget on Saturday morning to check out the Saturday Morning Post on Nisi's Notes. I'll see you next week here on Executive Suite.